All right, guys, welcome back. We're going to go over the last two sections of chapter two, two, four, and two, five, which will not only conclude that chapter, but our unit one, which includes chapters one and two, which again, remember, means we have our exam coming up a week from today. And that will be open for 24 hours. It'll be on Canvas. You'll need to have your webcam on so that I can see your face, preferably if you can push it far enough back. Also, what you're working on, that would be preferable. But either way, you're going to be sending that to me so that I can see all the work that you've done so that I can award you the points. I don't want just answers. Okay, This class is about learning how to do things, not just what the answers or solutions are. Okay, So I'm going to go over this section 2.4 real quick with you all. And then we'll do 2.5. And we will call it good. So if you guys would like to meet, even for those of you that haven't been coming to every meeting, which I know many of you have, um, on Wednesday, 9 a.m., we will be going over all of the stuff that we've been talking about this unit, okay, chapters one and two. That group quiz, I called it E1 for exam one, that's all we'll be doing on Wednesday. So preferably, you'll already have looked it over maybe even tried every single problem so that you know, I'm not quite getting this. Can we go over that in a group? And then I'll also chime in and help and guide you guys in the right direction as well. All right. So that will be for Wednesday. But I wanted to give you guys a quick memory or warm up test on all the things that we went over last time. Now, remember, I told you guys all to memorize those big three reference angles we called them the 30 the 45 and the 60 with the big three trig functions the sine cosine and tangent if you remember all the other ones on top of that the cosecant secant and cotangent even faster you'll be but otherwise remember they're just reciprocal functions you can just flip them okay so i'm going to give you guys a few minutes to try these real quick I think I gave you 12 of them just to give you a couple of different options. Okay. So if you guys are watching this back on the video, go ahead and pause it right here. Try those without using your notes. All right. And the rest of you guys that are here with me, I'll give you five minutes to knock that out. All right. Ready? Go. All right, hopefully that was enough time for you guys to knock those out, at least the ones that you know. Anybody have any questions on any of these? You want me to go over any of them? If not, again, this is simply for you guys to make sure that you are doing what I've requested, and that's memorizing these reference angles and then being able to evaluate them for at least the big three sine, cosine, tangent. Anybody want me to go over any of these? Uh, if you could go over all 12, just to make sure we have them right. Sure. I'm okay with that. Let me blow this up a little bit so that we can just go one by one. You need to know where 210 degrees is. And as I've mentioned before, and as I'm going to continue to, drawing really, really helps in this class. You don't need to get fancy. Just get to 210 which means I know that I'm drawing this and I'm referencing 180 degrees. And if I'm going to travel 210, that means I'm going to have to go the 180 plus 30 more. So two things we need to make sure that we're aware of, what quadrant we're in to know whether it's positive or negative, and then what our reference angle is so that we can evaluate for the correct ratio for whatever trig function they give us. So in this case, I know I'm really looking at 30 degrees as my reference angle for sine. I already know. I have that memorized. It's one half. All I have to make sure is that I know I'm in quadrant three, and therefore, it's negative. It's that simple. Okay, so I'll run through the rest of these very quickly as well. Cosine of 315. I know I'm almost to 360 degrees, but I'm going to have to come back. How much? 45. 
So I have a 45 degree angle that I'm gonna come back from that. So again, reference angle of 45. I know the cosine of 45 is what? Root two over two. Excellent. And all students take calculus because I'm in quadrant four where cosine is positive. This is going to stay positive. Guys, that's how easy this is. And again, what helps you to see what you're doing? A quick little sketch. Tangent of 120. Uh, tan 30. Careful. 180, I'm going to have to come back. 60. Yeah. Right? That's a 60 degree reference angle, which I know is going to be negative. And all I got to then therefore remember is what the tangent of 60 is. And that is what? Uh, root three. Negative root three. Very good. Now I did throw in a few other than the big three. Reciprocal functions, as you can see, the next three there are secant, cotangent, and cosecant. And I also threw in some quadrantal angles, multiples of 90. And 270, I know, is located here. Now, if you had to choose, for those of you guys that aren't watching my videos all the way, not just our live meetings, but the actual pre-recorded videos, what did we say would be the easiest length to get to that point of 270 degrees? Because we need to know the X, the Y, and the R, right? So what would be the easiest one for the size of a circle of rotation that we could do? What would be the best radius to choose if we had a choice? It would be one, which means if I go out some distance, I'm going to choose a radius of one if I ever have the chance. That is called, therefore, the unit circle, because as we rotate around, if we're out one unit of measurement and we keep rotating around, whether it's a 90, 180, 270, or 360, is therefore going to create what is called the unit circle. So if they never tell you what the length is, then you get to decide, and we're always going to decide on the easiest one, which is one. So hopefully you can see that we have the X, the Y, and the R. And you know hopefully that secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So all we need to know is our R which is one, and our x, which is zero. And remember we talked about, can we divide something by nothing? No, and therefore it's undefined. Everybody okay with that? All right, cool. How about the cotangent of 135? Whenever you see your angle ending in a five, what reference angle do you think that you're going to end up with? The 30, the 60, or the 45? 45. All you got to figure out is what quadrant. And since we're less than 180, we're thinking 45 degrees in quadrant. Two, which means positive or negative? Negative. Not because of the C, but because it's cotangent, which is the reciprocal of tangent. And remember, because it's a 45, do you know the tangent of 45? One. Then what happens when you take the cotangent and flip it? Still get one. 
Okay, guys, don't make this harder than it is. Once you get so good at these, you'll stop even writing down the little drawings. You'll just recognize 150 is a what reference angle? Thirty degree reference angle. And all you need to know is what this is the reciprocal of. What is cosecant the reciprocal of? Sin. Very good. Sine. Vanessa. Sine. Sign. Yep. And do we know the sine of 30? One half. Good. We just did it up here. And therefore, Stella, what are we going to put instead? Two. Very good, Anissa. We'll flip it. Do the reciprocal. All we got to make sure is, is it positive or negative? It's positive. Very good. Careful. This C, the T, the S only apply to our big three, sine, cosine, and tangent. And since this is just the flipped version of sine, we know it's going to stay positive. How'd you guys do on the first six? Good. Pretty well. Good. This should be easy, right? I'm just trying to make sure that you guys are learning this stuff. Tangent of 210. What's our reference angle? Should be a 30. Good, because you're going the 180 plus you'd have to go 30 more to get to that 210 degrees of rotation. And we're in what quadrant? The third quadrant. Which means we're gonna get a positive something. All you gotta know is what the tangent of 30 is. What's the tangent of 30? Root three over three. Remember we said anytime a 30, 60, 90 is involved, we're gonna have the root three involved. Whether it's root three over two or root three over three, or just root three, depends on sine, cosine, or tangent. And of course, the angle. Luis, I don't know if you're looking these up or you have them memorized, but it sounds like you know your stuff. That's good. The rest of you, hopefully you're working on memorizing these as well. But the only way that you can do that is with repetition. Okay, sine of 300, where are we at? Negative one half. Very good. This is the fourth quadrant. Careful though. We are in the fourth quadrant. It is going to be negative, but it's not going to be a half. Because we're almost to 360. We're less 60 though. This is going to be a reference angle of 60. So yes, it is going to be negative, but what's the sign of 60? Square three over two. Very good. I know it's not one half because that's 30, so it's the other one. It's the root three over two. Awesome. Try to give you guys a bunch of different options here. 240. Past 180, but not to 270. So how much more than 180 would we rotate? That would be 60 more. So I know I have a reference angle of 60. I know I'm in quadrant three. And since we're doing cosine, it's going to be negative. And do you know the cosine of 60? Negative one half. Very good, guys. And this is Luis. We got the negative because of the quadrant. We got the reference angle of 60. For cosine, which we should know is one half, because we know the sine of 30 is also one half. Hopefully, you guys are feeling pretty good about this stuff. To go 180 degrees, I'm at one of my four quadrants. 
which means I know this point. I know the X and the Y and therefore the R. What would that point be? One, zero. Careful. Left would be negative one, zero, but it would have a radius of what? One. That's how far I'd go out. So I know the X, the Y, and the R, which means you should be able to tell me any trig function I ask. This one, cotangent, which you know is the reciprocal function of tangent. And what do we know tangent is always the what over the what? Y over X. So this would have to be X over Y. And do we have our X and our Y? Yes. Negative one and zero. And what do we say we cannot ever do? We can't divide by that zero. And therefore... We don't get a value out, even if you punch that in your calculator, which you don't have a cotangent button, you'd get undefined. Okay, last two, cosecant, 225, what are we thinking? Negative squared, uh, negative root two. Good, we should be thinking of a 45, so you're already thinking of the root two stuff. And because it's cosecant, we know we're dealing with sine. It's going to be negative. Now, do we know the sine of 45? That's what Anissa was saying was root 2 over 2. But if we want to take this and flip it to get our cosecant of 45, then we got to flip this which unfortunately gives us that root on bottom. Then we're going to have to do all of this to get two root two over two, cancel the two. Wouldn't it be a whole heck of a lot easier to just memorize that? However you get there, make sure you can show me how you got there. All right, or memorize it and just put it. Give me a little sketch so I know that you know this and you didn't just look it up and guys i do not want a big old long decimal i want the exact answer if i want you to approximate then you can punch it into your calculator okay last one here secant of 330 what do we got what kind of reference angle uh 30 degrees good we're just going to come back 30 degrees to get to that 330 that's the point we want to get to. We'll drop the whole perpendicular. We'll have the 90, we'll have the 60 up here, the 30 there. But I got secant. So I like the fact that it's 30. I'll check my quadrant. Oh, it's, it's not the S, so it's negative, right? Uh, I believe it's cosine. Very good. Careful. Remember, these are only for the big three. Okay, everything's positive there. You don't have to worry about it, but sine, cosine, and tangent only. Just because you see an S, don't use the S. Okay, it is the reciprocal of cosine. So very good, Luis, it is going to be positive. And do we know the cosine of 30? Square three over two. Very good. So... Secant is going to be 2 over root 3, or multiplying by our fancy 1, 2 root 3 over 3. Positive. Anybody get 100%? Not me. Most of them, but... That's not 100, Charles. Come on. We're in math. No, I'm just kidding. No, no. Okay. I don't expect you guys to get 100 yet, but uh, a week from now, I would like you to be able to know these, right? This is the last thing that we went over. That's why I wanted to give you guys a bunch of different looks as a quick little warm up here to see if you're actually putting in the time. 
right? How much stuff did we really memorize? Not that much. The 30, the 45, and the 60 for sine, cosine, and tangent. That's the minimum I'm asking you to memorize. The rest of these, especially the quadrantal, oops, excuse me, where was that quadrantal? Quadrantal angles there and there, you can draw out and just list your X, Y, and R. All right, so make sure that you guys have all of that down for a week from today. And again, it's not going to go away. It will not just be for this test. You'll be continually using these facts. So take the time, it'll pay dividends. All right, so here's 2.4, solutions and applications of right triangles. Now you may be a little bit scared of the apps because that typically means word problems, okay? So we're gonna learn how to solve all the solutions of right triangles, and then talk about how we can apply this to the real world, all right? That's what a lot of people always wanna know. When will I ever use this? Right now, okay? But no, I can't predict the future. I don't know what you guys are gonna end up doing, but of course there are applications of this in the real world. Otherwise, we wouldn't be learning it. But it doesn't mean everything that you learn in college is directly gonna relate. It's about also becoming a well-rounded person, okay? Learning how to think outside of the triangle, the box, okay? so. What does it mean to solve a triangle? What do you think? Find all its values. Very good. If I wanna solve a triangle, I wanna find all the parts to it, which means Everything, like Anissa said, all three angles and all three sides. Now, are they gonna always ask for all six things? Well, no, actually, they're, they're gonna have to give us something in order to find these things, right? So how do we find the angles when we're given sides? Do you guys remember what we did in order to find angles? We used the what button on our calculator or technique. It was the inverse of the trig functions. Very good. Excellent, Luis. So here's the cool part, guys. Here's the one thing that's really nice about this in order to solve. A triangle. You're going to need at least three things. Which means if there are a total of three angles and three sides, meaning six unknown parts, they're gonna have to give us how many? Half. They're gonna have to give us at least three things. And one of them is going to have to be a side. That's pretty much it for this whole section. That's 2.4 in a nutshell. What are we gonna be doing in 2.4? Solving triangles.
What does that mean to do? Find all the unknowns in order to solve them. What three things are they going to give us? And what three things are they going to ask us to find? Sticking with that try angle theme. Okay. Now, there are some things that I wanted to make sure vocabulary wise you understand. And that is angle of depression and elevation. These are some terms that they will throw out for these application problems. Okay. What do you think an angle? of depression or elevation means. What would you draw if you were thinking angle of depression? For angle of depression, probably something that's going downward. Very good. Which means if you're walking, right, and you're looking straight, that means that we're going to take this and we're going to rotate down. Some angle. So still using that X axis, that number line that we originally started counting with in kindergarten as our reference, our starting place, that positive X direction. Okay, now it can be to the left and we can rotate down as well. That's just going to put us in a different place. Okay, well, then what about? An angle of elevation. Upwards. Very good. We're still going to need that line. But this time, we're going to take that line, and we're going to start down a little bit lower. And then we're going to take that and rotate what direction? up because we're what elevation you're thinking up what's the elevation of that mountain or that city right we're talking about how far up it is from that ground level where depression you guys have probably heard of that in movies, hopefully not experienced it yourself, but you're down. Okay, it's pretty easy. But I don't know if you notice one thing that's a little peculiar about it is if I took this and actually slid it over and matched those up. Do you guys see what I just created? What would these two lines be? Parallel. And what did we call this if it cut through those parallel lines? That was called a transversal. And do you remember what these two angles if we had parallel lines cut by a transversal, we're called? Alterior, interior angles. Ah, oh, very close. What'd you say again, Anessa? Alternative interior. Very good. Alternate Alter interior angles. Very good. And what was true about alternate interior angles? They're equal. Very good. Their measurements were equivalent. We called them congruent. Because one's up here from this point that the angle is formed. And then one from this point where the angle is formed. So they're not the exact same angles, but they are the exact same measurement. So some of that can come back into play. And or won't go away. And we got to know that. Does it really matter that you know the name? No, I'm glad Anissa did, but what matters more is that you know that they are congruent. They have the exact same measurement. Very good. Does everybody see how I kind of blended those together? Now, I will warn you, 
most of the time when we're talking about an angle of depression or elevation, it's not going to be from one point or another. It's going to be from one point. So if it was an angle of elevation from there, I would have gone up from there or depression down from there. Okay, but if you're talking about between two things, say trees or whatever, right, then the depression from, say, the top of the tree or whatever to the bottom of the tree or from the bottom of that tree to the top of the other one, they're going to be different. And you need to know that it's talking about always from the x-axis. But a drawing, as I mentioned before, really, really helps. So that's it for 2-4. You guys want to move on to 2-5, or do you want to start working on the group quiz a little bit? It's up to you. Short and sweet for 2-4. Not much to it. No, I think we can go to the other section. Sounds good. Now, again, one thing I want to make sure that you guys remember all the things that we've talked about and used. If it's a right triangle and they give me one of my angles, then I technically know how many. Why do I know two angles if they only really gave me one? What do they tell me? What kind of triangle is it? If it's a right triangle, that means it's 90 degrees. Very good. And one thing you want to make sure that you do is when you draw it, you draw it appropriately. Okay? When I draw my right triangle, it doesn't matter if you draw it perfectly like that. But when you label it, when you draw that right angle, almost always they're going to have that be the capital C. So which one is my A and which one is my B doesn't really matter. But what does matter is where you place them so that what you call your side A and your side B. Because again, if I call this A and this B, then if this is the angle that I'm calling A, then this angle that is formed by these two sides form a third side. And since this angle, A, is what created that side, guess what we're going to call this side? A. Little a. So lengths are going to be lowercase. Angles, uppercase. So this would be little c and this would be little b. So that is the one thing you want to make sure that you do is at least label it correctly. And as I mentioned, I will highlight for you, angle C is typically what they're going to call the right angle. Okay? Otherwise, just be very careful with your drawing and using the proper words to set up, hopefully, a right triangle that you can then solve the unknown attributes, whether those be side lengths or angles. One more thing. If I gave you angle A and I told you it's a right triangle, then how would you find angle B? Do you need trig to find that angle? You just to subtract the ones that you know from 180. Very good. Excellent, Anessa. We know from geometry, and I proved it with you guys, we all cut out and tore out our angles, and we saw that it was a semicircle. We know that the three angles of a triangle always add up to 180. And if one of them's 90, we know the other two add up to be what? 90. Which means, Anissa, you could actually make it a little bit easier on yourself and because I know this is 90, I don't have to use the 180. Because if I'm given this angle, let's say it's 40 degrees to keep it simple, then what would angle B be? Fifty. 
Good, that was too slow. <laughs> Eric was going to chime in. It's 50. How did I know that so fast? These two have to add up to be 90 since this is 90. So again, we won't always have that scenario, but if we do, cool. What if I give you two out of the three sides? What are you going to use to find the third side? Pythagorean theorem. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Now, what if I give you these two sides, but I don't tell you anything about the other two angles? How would you find angle A if I gave you these two sides? That's where you do need trig. I could use my tangent. Why tangent? It's the opposite over the adjacent. So I'd put those values in, but to find the angle, what would I have to use? What did we say? We want to use that arc or inverse tan so that we could flip that stuff around and say that I have arc tangent or inverse tangent of that little A side over the little B side, and that will give me my A. And again, whether you put arc or that negative one, it's the inverse. But now you can see I got my equation solved for the thing I wanted. Okay. So again, I know there's not a lot of notes, but this is 2.4 in a nutshell. We're going to be using all the stuff that we've accumulated up to this point to solve for all the unknown parts of a triangle. And then we will do similar things by drawing things out from a word problem, a short paragraph. And ultimately, what are you hoping that you end up with? Or what do you know that you're going to end up with? a right triangle so that you can use all the information that we've learned up to this point. All right, that's two, four. Let's move on to two, five, which as you can see by the title, <laughs> it's just further apps of these right triangles. Okay. Now I will warn you 2.5 is a little bit more challenging. And I do like that the book split it into two sections, but that's all we're dealing with in 2.5 are more and different types of word problems. So if you guys haven't watched the pre-recordings already and talked about the two methods of bearings, I wanted to make sure that I go over that with you real quick for each quadrant in each method. Is anybody familiar with the two methods? No, sir. Appreciate your honesty. Watch the videos. That's what they're there for. Now I know it's Monday, 9 a.m., but again, this is why I have those pre-recordings, okay? Method one versus method two. It's pretty simple. Method one's only gonna give you one thing. Method two is gonna give you two things, okay? And when do we have to get our bearings? Well, that's when we don't have street signs. We don't have monuments. That means when we're out at sea. Because when you're out on the ocean, you can't say, hey, go to the Wendy's and make a left. Oh, sorry. There isn't that. Which means you have a compass. And what's the one thing that the compass always stays true to? No. Very good. That's how they get their bearings. Using method one. They're going to give us 
one thing, and that is an angle. That's the one thing that they're going to provide. Okay, so give me an acute angle. Sixty. Good. Give me something a little bit bigger. Past 90, but not to 180. Hundred and twenty. I like all these that you're choosing. They're very friendly. Uh, keep going past one eighty now, but not to two seventy. Two thirty. I like it. And then one more past two seventy, but not all the way around three sixty. Three forty. If I gave you these four things and I asked you to graph them using either method one or method two, you should be able to do so. So let's split it and we'll do each thing. Sorry, that was supposed to be highlighter. Method one I'll do in green. Method two, I'll do in blue. So if I was going to go 60 degrees, what would I do? Well, if I only have a compass and I only gave you that one thing, then what does that mean? I'm going to start always looking. When I draw that one, it looks like a one. It's pointing the direction you're going to start. Now, this is tricky, guys. Everything that we've talked about, where did we always start when we built our angle? It was always the x-axis, right? Whether we were looking to the positive or the negative right we said well let's just stay positive and then if we're going to rotate up that's a positive rotate down a negative and that's what we said is true and true and it's still going to be that except when you're at sea and the only thing you have to go by is a compass which is always starting due north and then you move it around and you can see where the north is but then it shows you the rotation in degrees. So if I'm going 60 degrees, where am I going to start? I'm going to start due north. And if you were to guess what direction we're going to rotate, either to the right or to the left, for positive 60, what would you guess? Rotate to the right. Why, Luis? I cannot say. Why would you? Why did you say it then? Uh, because I figured it would be the opposite from like on a graph. Well, remember that the y-axis split the x-axis into two parts. The positive versus the negative values for our x. So if it's 60, we're going to start with method one looking that one direction north. But when it says 60, we're also going to rotate positively to the right rather than negatively to the left. Does that make sense? Not really. No? OK. So let me explain it again. Remember, we started with the x-axis, right? Our number line. And the number zero was the thing that split the positives from the negatives, correct? Yes. So we said, well, let's stick with the positives. Let's not start looking there. And then what rotation are we going to go? Well, our options are either up or down. And since we started looking in the positive x direction, we said, let's start in the 
positive y direction. And that's how we built our angles. Until now. And only for these bearing problems, because when at sea, the only thing we have to go by is the compass, which always starts with that due north. That's the one thing that's marked on there. So that's where we're going to start now. And since we're on the y axis now as our starting place, we know that the x axis also splits the positives and the negatives. So since this is the positive direction, we said instead of looking south, we're going to start looking north. And then we're going to rotate to the positive right versus the negative left. It makes sense now. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Again, for the similar reasons. X-axis, we said, all right, let's start the positive and go up positive. Well, now we're going Y-axis, starting in the positive and going to rotate to the positive. Now, the problem is it looks like it's going down, but this is also looks like it's going down. So that's why I'm trying to differentiate between from the right and the left. Okay, so then 120 degrees, what would be that rotation? Well, if I only gave you one thing, you're going to start by looking north, and you're going to rotate how much? Well, I'm definitely going to go more than 90, but am I going to go 180? No, I would actually just have to go 30 more. And can you guys see how much I rotated? I went 90 plus 30 more to get that 120 degrees. Now, why might I want to write that 30 in there? What are we always trying to get in this class? A uh, right triangle. Very good. We're trying to get not only a triangle, but a right triangle so we can use our Pythagorean theorem. We can use the sum of all the, we can use our trig functions. So absolutely. That's why it's nice. Even though I may use it, I may not. Now I have not just somebody picked very wisely, 120 degrees, but now I have a 30, 60, 90 when I drop it to my x-axis again. How about 230? Start north. I like to just dash in my axes because what do I know I'm gonna have to go well, they told me positive 230, right? So I'm going to start to the right. And I know I'm going to have to go more than 180. Am I going to go another 90? Am I going to get to 270? Not quite. So I will be somewhere over here. And it would be a 40 degree. To get all the way to 270. 180 plus 50 more, which leaves me with the 40 to get to the next 90. How about 340 degrees? I'm almost going to go all the way around, aren't I? So what would be better than saying 340 degrees? Remember talking about those co-terminal angles, adding or subtracting 360, however many times we want? Because what would that yield? Uh, 
Uh, negative 20? Definitely negative because that's the bigger number. And I know 360 minus 340 is just a difference of 20. But you know that negative would mean to the left rather than to the right. So I could just go back. that 20 degrees, or I could rotate all the way around, which they told me to, from the north, 340 degrees. Does that make sense? The direction I'd be going for that would be there. The direction I'd be going for that would be there. For 120, it'd be along that, 60, along that line. For how long and at what rate? Depends on what we're trying to accomplish. Everybody good? Because this is different. It's going to take some getting used to, no doubt. So what method two does is now give us two things. And what's beautiful about method two is not only does it give us twice as much, all of its angles will be acute. So this is what every single one of them will look like for method two. They'll start with, hey, am I looking up or down? They'll tell you some acute angle to rotate in this east or west direction. So what I'd like you all to do with me right now is tell me how to get to all of these places that we just did for method one. How could I get to all of those points? What would you tell me to do for that first one? We'll call it part A. Using method two, how would you also get me to that exact same point? Where would we start looking? Starting north, you would rotate 60 degrees west, I mean east. That's it. Much easier to see. Start here, rotate this much in that direction. How did you know east? North, east, south, west. Good. Notice again the positive direction of rotation for every single one of these was clockwise right how about for part b how would we get to this point where would we start by looking what hemisphere are we in southern we're starting in the south but this time we're going to rotate to the what Sixty. Very good, in the eastern direction. Again, these were random. Just so happened that they're each 60 so far. But again, notice they take us to much different places just by switching out the north and the south. Wait, why is it south? Good question. So here we started north and we rotated 60 degrees to the east to get to that point. Right? Think of you starting at the origin and I want to get to this point. And I'm going to tell you, we'll start looking to the north so we have somewhere to reference. And then I'm going to tell you to rotate so much of an angle to the right or the eastern direction. And now you'd be facing this direction. You could come meet me out there. Where if I started north and I told you to rotate to the east, I might as well just tell you to rotate 120 degrees. So method two is going to split the north and the south up. 
And if you're not up here, then that means you're down here. And we're going to start in the south, and we're going to rotate to the east, however many degrees, to face this direction. Does that make sense, Anissa? Yeah, a little. So we're starting in the south so that we can rotate a smaller angle. Remember, they're always going to be acute. So I only want to be playing in this quadrant. So we're starting south, rotating 60 degrees east. And I circled the 30 so that we knew that the rest of this was 60. So let's go to C and see if you guys can do this. C, we said you can rotate 230 degrees and you'd be facing this direction to get to this point. Or what else could we do using method two? Starting south, you rotate 40 degrees west. So we're going to start south and we're going to rotate 60 degrees. My bad. My Careful. How many degrees to the west? Uh, 40. I got mixed up like twice. And now a third time. Two hundred and thirty degrees will be that one hundred and eighty to get here. Plus how much more? What's the difference between 180 and 230? 50. And that's why I labeled this as 40, so that I know that this is my right angle between the west and the south. So then this would have to be 50. Does that make sense? Yeah. Start in the south, rotate to the west, but this time we need the 50 degree increment. So this one will be south 50 degrees to the west. Starting south, rotating to get to this point. So how about that last one, 340 degrees that somebody chose? Almost a full 360, almost facing exactly the direction we already were to the north, but not quite. 340 degrees is, we said, 20 less than that 360. So what would be a whole lot faster to getting there, rather than rotating our body all the way around, starting north and rotating all the way around to facing that direction, what could we do instead? Start by looking what? Come on, where are all my Kardashian fans out there? We're going to start by looking north and rotate to the what? To the left or to the west. west. That's my Kardashian joke. Northwest? No? Nobody? Okay. How many degrees to be 20. looking at that point? There's that 20 degrees to the west. So notice... I can tell you this or that. I can tell you this or that. Any of these things will get me to that same direction or bearings out at sea. Method two gives you two directions. A north rotate an east. A south rotate a west. But method one only gives us one angle, which means you're always going to start to the north and rotate to the right, positive, clockwise. Okay? So that is why they gave us a whole other section. This stuff is different. And not only are we going to have that in this section, we're also going to have this thing called sig figs or significant digits meaning that we're only focusing on the digits. How many numbers are they given? 
because they are significant. They matter because you should not be able to be more exact than what I measured that I provided to you. Does that make sense? If not, let me give you a little story to kind of make it make more sense. You guys are familiar probably with, especially nowadays in these last two years, of taking temperature to try to see if you had COVID and this and that. What is a normal temperature for a human being? But that's in Fahrenheit. Okay? And that's totally false. It's not 98.6. Have you ever taken your temperature and is it exactly that? Probably not. It's probably close to it, right? Give or take a little bit. But here's what happened, you guys. I don't know if you know about the whole temperature gauge and how it was created, but there was two fellas, one with the last name of Fahrenheit. Then he was the original guy that came up with the tool, the temperature gauge called a thermometer. And what he did, unfortunately, was he made all the tick marks for his thermometer and then went and measured, okay, when does it get to boiling? And when does it get to freezing temperature? And do you guys even know what boiling and freezing is in our system, Fahrenheit? What is it? Does anybody know? I'm sure you all know freezing temperature. What's freezing temperature? 32. Yeah, most people know. 32. What kind of number is that? What would have made a whole heck of a lot more sense? Celsius. We'll get there, but what number? Zero. Wouldn't that make more sense? Zero. That's freezing, right? Anybody know boiling temperature in Fahrenheit? Isn't it like around 200? Yeah, very good. It's actually 212 degrees. 232. Those are terrible. So another guy came along by the last name of? Celsius. Yep. Anders, what's his first? Anders Celsius. And you know what he said? He said, hey, man, great job that we now can kind of have a gauge of whether it's cold or hot or freezing or boiling. But your system sucks. It's not very good. So you know what he did is he took his thermometer and he took where 32 and where 212 were. And he marked that, what do you think he marked freezing? Zero. And what do you think he marked boiling? 100. Yep. And then he just measured out evenly from zero to 100, the tick marks by 10 Celsius. And you know what the rest of the world uses? Celsius. You know what the U.S. uses? Fahrenheit. We're sticking strong. So the problem is when I tell you guys, hey, you know, it's actually going to be 32 degrees Celsius out. What are you thinking? Do I need a coat or am I wearing a tank top? Right? We don't have an understanding of it. But what happened with the significant figures. What I originally wanted to talk to you about was somebody said, hey, let's try to figure out what the human temperature is normally. And guess who did it? It wasn't somebody in America. It was somebody in Europe, which means they used to measure on average Celsius. And when they gave those average temperatures of the big sample space of, say, 10,000, 100,000 people, whatever it was, to try to get the average temperature, guess what they gave it to? Two decimal points or uh, two digits. So they said it was the 34 or the 32 or whatever it was. 
But guess what they did when they changed it over to Fahrenheit? They gave it to three. They shouldn't have. What should we be saying that the standard temperature of a human being is? Two sig figs. That's significant, right? Now, is it a big deal that we're talking about? Well, kind of, especially right now. People are like, oh, you're running a temperature. You're at 99. Stay away from me, COVID, right? But again, this is about, give or take, what the standard temperature should be. So whenever you are given a problem to solve, Oops, went too far. Solve a triangle. And they give you three digits for all of the information that they gave you, whether it's three angles, three sides, or a mixture of the two. Then you have to give them back what? Those unknown measurements, whether they're angles or sides, to three digits okay so that's the big thing that we're talking about here with significant figures or digits you cannot give me better than what they gave you you can't give me a more exact measurement just because you found some other stuff you didn't give me the initial measurements that's it so if they don't say it around to the nearest tenth or hundredth, then you look at, all right, what was the least number of digits or figures that they gave me? Then that's the least that I can give them back. So if this has a little A of 27 centimeters, and then they give you a big A of 29.2 degrees, and then a big B, of let's say 81.7 degrees, what would you give me for the little c, big c, and little b? How many sig figs? For the little ones, only two. For all of them, only two. Yep. Very good, Anissa. Even though these are to three, one of them only gave me two, so I can't give more than that. Now, I know what you mean. You're like, well, they measured the angle, so I should. Technically, it should only be two. Okay, now this is going to translate more into your chemistries, biologies, your science classes. This matters a little bit more. Physics. Okay, for us. Not as much, but I wanted to make sure that I hit that home. And remember, if they say round to this or that, then just do it. They're allowing you to bypass this. Okay, but if they don't specify, then you need to look at those and say, well, what's the minimum they gave? That's all I can give. Okay. So in conclusion, what is a general strategy to tackling word problems? especially in this class. What should you do first? That's the first thing. Make sure you read the problem in its entirety. Then 
What's the key? What do they want to know? What did they ask us to find? One thing, three things, whatever. And then secondly, what did they give us to find it or those things? What's the second thing? What usually helps you to see what you're working with? Very good. And in this class, what are you anticipating drawing? Right triangle. Very good. Most likely it's going to be a triangle. Hopefully it's a right triangle so that we can use all of our trig and everything that we've talked about previous. Okay. Third thing and final thing. You're going to use those two parts. You're going to use those two things in order to set up a equation or an equation so that you can solve. And in order to solve, you need one unknown with that one equation so that you can isolate it and get it by itself. That's it. That's unit one in a nutshell with these last two sections being mostly word problems, okay? So here's what they give in the book. I can go back up if you guys are still writing any of that down or you can take a screenshot, pause it, rewind it. But this is what they say in the book. Draw it, label what you have, use it to write an equation and then solve that equation. And don't forget to make sure your answer makes sense. Okay, there's that three-step approach in our own words and theirs. Okay, that's all I got for you today. Um, the rest of the time will be dedicated to working on, remember, the group quiz is a little bit different this week. Uh, the first one, 4.1, so week four, first meeting, uh, two, four, and two, five, the last two sections of chapter two, but because that now concludes chapter two, we will not only have our homework on 2425, this group quiz to make sure that we got it down a little bit more practice. You're also going to have the IQ number two, which is the individual quiz for chapter two. All right? You got as many attempts as you want on that, and that will be done on Canvas through the My Math Lab portal. Okay. Uh, don't forget the first one as well. Those will also help you to practice and prepare for the exam one, which will be a week from today, Monday, okay, February the 7th. It'll be open for 24 hours that day. You'll have a two hour time period to tackle it, and you will need a webcam. You will need to download a uh, site called Proctorio that will basically just show me uh, what you're doing as you're doing it, both on your screen and your webcam. And uh, any other questions, you let me know. You will be writing this stuff out and just like with the group quizzes, submitting your work for the exam on there, okay? So if anybody has any questions on that, show up on Wednesday where we will just be working on the group quiz for exam one, okay? That's all we'll do on that day. So if you have time, start going and looking through it, trying the problems that you no might be a little bit more challenging. That way we can take that two hours on Wednesday from nine to 11 and go over stuff. Don't forget, I also have office hours Monday through Friday, as do, now we have two TAs that are available 
for you guys throughout the week. One on campus, unfortunately, who contracted COVID. So he's online as well this week. His name's Timmy. And then I also have your classes, the online version. His name is Anthony, and he's available throughout the week as well. Right? If you guys have any questions, put them on the discussion board. Uh, that way I can answer it to everyone. Uh, otherwise, if it's more personal, feel free to message me. Uh, otherwise, good luck wrapping up this chapter two, preparing to do well on chapter one and two, unit one exam on Monday, February 7th. You guys have a great one. I'll stick around and work with anybody that wants to on the group quiz.